In this final video on cardiovascular disease treatment, we're going to look at the common uh, cardiovascular medications that are essentially used to treat on the therapeutic order at level four. So if that's unfamiliar to you, go back and look at the last video so you understand what the different levels in the therapeutic order are. The first class of medications would be those that block the sympathetic nervous system. So remember, the sympathetics innervate the heart, especially the SA, the AV node, and the uh, myocardium. Um, and the receptors in the heart for the neurotransmitters of the sympathetics, which is norepinephrine, um, and remember the adrenal medulla secretes epinephrine. Uh, these are known as catecholamines. Uh, so norepi, epi will bind in the heart to beta-1 receptors, which are found on the cardiac myocytes. Um, just to remind you, there are beta-2 receptors on the lungs, the GI tract, the liver, uh, some of the vascular smooth muscle in your skeletal muscles. Um, so that's beta-2 receptors. And then we have beta-3 receptors in adipose tissue. Stimulation of beta-1 receptors usually results in an increased heart rate and contractility, uh, typically an increase in blood pressure as well. Beta-2 receptors result uh, actually in vasodilation in blood going into your skeletal muscles. And that allows during times of stress for blood to enter your large skeletal muscle group so that you get more energy there to be able to run away from a, a potential threat. Uh, but it also in the airways bronchodilates, opens up the uh, airways. And then beta-3 receptors mobilize fat from adipose tissue as a quick source of energy uh, for the body. Um, we then have alpha-1 receptors which are found in the rest of the vascular uh, smooth muscle. It's also found in some of the sphincters of your body, like the smooth muscle in your bladder. And so agents that work with alpha-1 receptors actually have a role in treating things like uh, uh, BPH, where we get uh, urination problems uh, from an enlarged prostate in males. Um, vasoconstriction usually is their kind of modus operandi. So stimulation of alpha-1 receptors will cause vasoconstriction in arterioles in the skin, mucosa, and your abdomen. So basically it takes blood away from all of your abdominal organs when alpha ones are stimulated. And then in terms of the GI tract and the urinary bladder, uh, alpha one stimulation causes sphincter contraction. So if you can imagine alpha one blocking agents um, would have the opposite effect. And we'll look at some of those below. Alpha two receptors, the final receptor of the sympathetic nervous system are found in the brain and on smooth muscle and basically their effect is to inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. So alpha-2s think of as kind of a break on the system. When they're stimulated, we get a down regulation of the sympathetics. Um, again, in, in the blood vessel supply and skeletal muscle, um, they add vascular smooth muscle, there's alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors. Alpha-1 stimulation is gonna give vasoconstriction. Beta-2 stimulation will result in vasodilation. Okay, so that's a real quick summary of the sympathetic nervous system and its receptors. Beta blockers are gonna block the beta receptors and they come in different types. So they're uh, either gonna block both beta one and beta two, or they're gonna be selective to beta one specifically. So let's talk about what some of these are. So the non-selective agents, they block both beta one, beta two. They're gonna have the most adverse effects because they have the most generalized action. Uh, but that'd be things like propranolol, also known as Inderol, uh, Carvedilol. Uh, notice again kind of with drug names, we have the generic, and then the brand has the trademark. And you know, once these things go off patent and become generic, then we usually don't use the trademark names anymore. We just use the, the generic name. Uh, Carvedilol, known the uh, trademark name is Coreg, uh, Labetalol, uh, Natalol, and Timolol. These would all be non-selective agents um, now, carvedilol and labetalol um, also have alpha blocking activity, so they promote arterial vasodilation. The beta-1 selective agents are specific to the beta-1s on the heart primarily. They have fewer adverse effects, and that would include atenolol and metoprolol. So depending on what we're trying to do, um, the different agents can be used. So they're gonna bind and block the beta receptors. So in the heart, that's gonna result in a decrease of heart rate and decrease contractility. And in the kidneys, it will cause a lowering of blood pressure by decreasing renin secretion. Um, so the uses would be for high blood pressure. They're not primary agents for blood pressure, but they have a secondary or tertiary role in some patients. 
um, angina, cardiac arrhythmias, history of any previous MI. A lot of people when they've been hospitalized for MI will come out with a beta blocker as part of their prescription uh, or their medication list. Uh, congestive heart failure and different cardiomyopathies. They're also used, uh, especially the non-selective agents for anxiety, migraine, uh, thyroid storm, excess thyroid hormone, and then uh, central tremor and glaucoma. So this would be some of the other uses of the beta blockers. The adverse effects would be your typical kind of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You'll see that listed on pretty much every drug, same as fatigue. Um, hypotension, dizziness, your blood pressure drops too low. Bronchospasm, so here's a problem. If you block beta-2 receptors, remember beta-2, if you stimulate them, it causes bronchodilation. If you block them, that can cause bronchoconstriction. And so this is not a good idea for asthma patients. So that'd be one group of people to be very careful about uh, that they don't have beta blockers on board. Uh, causing the heart to slow down way too low. I've seen many cases of bradycardia where the heart rate falls below 60 as a result of beta blockers cold extremities, sexual dysfunction like erectile dysfunction, having very low blood sugar, and then uh, increasing, there's an increased risk of diabetes with these medications, a small risk, and then having um, vivid dreams, various forms of insomnia. Um, now, propranolol and metoprolol are lipid soluble. They cross the blood-brain barrier, so they have effects on the central nervous system as well. So you're gonna have more, more uh, systemic effects. Um, there is a treatment for overdose if a patient accidentally or intentionally overdoses on beta blockers. Giving uh, uh, intravenous glucagon um, is a treatment for that. Glucagon is a uh, pancreatic peptide. It opposes the action of insulin. It um, actually tries to increase your blood sugar. So um, glucagon can be given as an antidote to beta blockers. So, um, not an antidote, but for overdose of beta blockers. Uh, so that's beta blockers. I'll mention one effect I've seen. I don't know if it's really uh, in the reported literature, but weight gain. I've seen patients uh, gain a lot more weight once they started beta blockers. Um, so those are all the negative sides of beta blockers, very commonly used though. And we'll see their application as we go through different cardiovascular disorders. Now, sticking on the theme of the sympathetic nervous system, we also have alpha blockers. So these block the alpha receptors. Um, they have more limited use, things like hypertension. Uh, now, Raynaud's is interesting. Raynaud's is when you get the really cold hands, they actually turn blue, especially after your exposure to cold or something like that, or stress. Um, and one of the mechanisms is that your sympathetic nervous system overfires um, and uh, causes vasoconstriction. And in fact, one of the radical treatments for that is to actually cut all the sympathetic nerves coming from the neck into your arms to prevent that from happening. Uh, but one of the treatment that's used before we get to that stage would be to use alpha blockers. Um, you can also use calcium channel blockers. We'll talk about those later. But alpha blockers uh, might be used here, and then they might be used in erectile dysfunction as well. Uh, there are several classes. So there are non-selective alpha blockers. They'll block alpha-1 and alpha-2. There are selective alpha-1 uh, blockers and then selective alpha-2 blockers. And uh, remember, carbidilol and labetalol have both alpha and beta blocking agents. Um, alpha-1, alpha-2s, again, have different locations in terms of where they're found. But generally, we think of alpha-2s on our vascular uh, smooth muscle, and that's going to cause uh, vasoconstriction in many of our circulatory beds, uh, especially in the intestines and your peripheries and whatnot. Um, it's also in the eye, so this is going to cause uh, dilation. Uh, the uh, activation of the alpha-1 receptor actually causes dilation of the eye. So think of a person in a fight-or-flight response. The eyes really open up. That's under the influence of alpha-1 receptors. Um, it's going to, uh, they are also found in the little hairs that erect your, or the little muscles that erect your hairs and your skin. Those are called the piloerector muscles, and uh, alpha-1 receptors are found there. And when they get stimulated by norepinephrine or epi, it's going to cause your hair to stand up on end. Uh, they're found in the prostate, and unfortunately, if they're activated in the prostate, they cause contraction, and they can cause compression of the urethra, making it more difficult to urinate in males. And then in the heart, they increase the force of contraction. So alpha-1 blockers would undo all those effects. They would negate them. Um, so what are some of our uh, alpha-1 agents? 
um, that would be prazosin, terazosin, and doxazosin. Um, and these are uh, basically going to be vasodilators. They're going to decrease peripheral resistance and decrease blood pressure over time. Um, now, they don't induce what's called reflex tachycardia. What can happen if you drop your blood pressure too quickly is that the heart, in order to maintain cardiac output and perfusion, uh, increases the heart rate. So those the baroreceptor mechanisms and the medullary brainstem center uh, tell your heart to beat more quickly. And that, that could be a real issue with people that are already have underlying cardiac arrhythmias. It could be a big problem. Um, but um, they have less of that action uh, than other medications. So the uses is, again, not as a first or even second line therapy, often as a third line therapy for high blood pressure. We see them used in heart failure, in large prostates, um, PTSD, and then uh, in Raynaud's uh, syndrome, um, again. And the adverse effects would be hypotension, potentially passing out, fatigue, weakness, reflex tachycardia with palpitations, although again, less than other agents. Nasal congestion, this one's interesting. We have alpha-1 receptors in the um, blood vessels in, your, in the arterioles in your nose. And remember, this was discussed in the respiratory module. When you stimulate those alpha-1 receptors, it causes the blood vessels to vasoconstrict. And that's why phenylephrine and all those medications are used as nasal decongestants. Because when you constrict those arterioles, you get less uh, discharge. Um, in, in, the, in the nose and the sinuses. Um, if you block the uh, alpha-1 receptors, unfortunately, then we get uh, basically vasodilation of those vessels and we get more leakage of plasma out of them. We get more nasal discharge. And so that can cause more nasal congestion. And it can also cause uh, erections that last uh, for a long period of time, causing priapism. Um, the first dose response is uh, something that is accompanied by these, and that is that it can induce a very severe drop in blood pressure. Um, so a person takes it and then they pass out. Uh, that usually happens the first or second time they take it, and then after that it doesn't happen as much. And that's why sometimes it's best to uh, have patients you know, warn them. Again, if you're not prescribing these, you don't have to do this, but patients should be warned about um, you know not to get in the car after taking them or do something like that where they might pass out. Um, so that's alpha blockers, centrally acting alpha-2 agonists. So these are not blockers, these are agonists of alpha-2 receptors. Remember, the main effect of alpha-2 is to downregulate in the central nervous system your whole sympathetic system. And so that would be clonidine and methyl dopa. Um, these um, activate the alpha-2 receptors in the brain and they decrease central adrenergic outflow um, and they're gonna decrease your blood pressure, basically. So clonidine is used for um, uh, treatment-resistant hypertension, usually with a diuretic. Uh, it's also used in ADHD and drug withdrawal like alcohol, opioids or smoking withdrawal, uh, hot flashes and menopause and diarrhea. That would be all clonidine uses. And then methyl dopa is used in hypertensive emergencies. So this is one of the medications given in the emergency room for patients with very, very high blood pressure. And that just shuts off the sympathetic nervous system. As you can imagine, all the effects would be from a decreased sympathetic, increased parasympathetic. Um, so that can have all sorts of different effects. But uh, basically we can get very, very low blood pressure, uh, dry mouth, headache, nasal dryness, constipation, erectile dysfunction, and uh, generally clonidine has more, uh, I'm sorry, the methyl dopa has more adverse effects than the clonidine. Um, there also can be rebound hypertension if a patient is on, for example, clonidine, and they stop immediately, the, the blood pressure rebounds. These are not, uh, these uh, alpha blockers and alpha-2 agonists are not as commonly used, but I just want to point out that these are drugs in that sympathetic category, and they do have roles to play in hypertension. Now remember that uh, for cardiac myocytes to contract, they need calcium. And the calcium is stored normally inside of little bags called the sarcoplasmic reticulum inside of the myocyte. And then when that uh, cardiac action potential fires, it's gonna release the calcium and that's gonna cause the actin and myosin to bind and slide and contract the cardiac myocyte. Well, calcium channel blockers will block the calcium and they, they basically block the uh, ability of calcium to move from outside the heart muscle cell to the inside. 
Um, so they're going to decrease essentially muscle contraction. Um, they're also found, remember, in those pacemaker cells. So if you block the calcium channels, you're going to block the ability of the SA node, AV node to make their uh, normal, uh, to do their, their automatic pacing. But if you have a pacemaker that's overfiring, uh, like an tachyarrhythmia or something like that, then these would be very helpful agents. Um, we also, these same uh, calcium channels, these are specifically L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. So we already saw them in the heart. I just talked about skeletal muscle. They're also found in the adrenal cortex, and they regulate aldosterone secretion and cortisol secretion. <clears throat> um, so calcium channel blockers, or CCBs, would block those voltage-gated calcium channels. And um, we have, again, a couple of different agents. Some are very selective to the myocardium. You can say they're cardioselective, and that would be verapamil and diltiazem. Um, and then there'd be non-selective agents, not specific to the heart. They would work on other tissues like your blood vessels. And that those would be the dihydropyridine uh, calcium channel blockers. And that would be amlodipine, philodipine, and nifedipine. So these will um, work on other tissues. Now, interestingly, alcohol, ethanol uh, specifically, inhibits the uh, voltage-gated uh, L-type calcium channels as well. And so thus alcohol actually is a CCB. And I haven't listed it here, but a number of the herbs that are used in Chinese medicine, for instance, as herbs that treat blood stasis, um, many of them in the mint family, like Lycopis and Leonoris, um, have, have calcium channel blocking ability as well. Um, so those we could say are uh, sort of natural calcium channel blockers. So by blocking the entry of the uh, calcium ions through those voltage-gated channels, the uh, non-dihydropyridine, or the more myocardial selective agents would essentially um, decrease heart rate, decrease contractility, decrease the myocardial demand for oxygen, decrease coronary vasospasm, slow the SA node. Um, they would not be as potent as vasodilators because they're working more in the heart. And so we can see their use is applied to things like angina, different cardiac arrhythmias, and ischemic heart disease. Uh, the dihydropyridine CCBs all increase arterial dilation. Um, they would decrease the systemic vascular resistance that would drop arterial pressure. Um, they also tend to decrease vessel stiffness as well as aldosterone secretion from the adrenal gland. That lowers, all this lowers blood pressure. So these are primarily used to treat hypertension. So dihydropyridine CCPs, treatment of hypertension, non-dihydropyridine, more specific for the um, uh, the, the heart muscle, the myocardium. Slightly more effects, adverse effects than uh, of the calcium channel blockers and beta blockers, um, but they are um, better at actually lowering cardiovascular mortality. So in a lot of the uh, drugs we use, we have to ask, you know, okay, so maybe the drug stops this symptom or that symptom, lowers blood pressure, lowers blood sugar, but does it actually improve outcomes? Like, does it decrease the number of cardiovascular events or does it help a person prevent you know damage to their organs and so forth not all medications do that but calcium channel blockers are one of the groups that we actually have shown yes uh, they actually do prevent a lot of downstream or late stage effects in cardiovascular disease um, so some of the adverse effects would be low blood pressure hypotension constipation nausea headache uh, peripheral edema, that's a very common one in up to 70% of patients. Uh, so these are the kind of things, knowing this, patient comes in with edema, go over their medication list, aha, you're on a calcium channel blocker, you might want to talk to your doctor about that. Uh, that might be something we can modify. Uh, having uh, too slow of a heart rhythm, bradycardia, and then even what's called a heart block, where no electrical signal gets through the AV node. Uh, there is something called calcium channel blocker toxicity, and that's a very decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, uh, and that can actually result in cardiac arrest. Uh, and this unfortunately happens in uh, 2010 at least, the number was over 10,000 cases in the US um, of CCB toxicity. There's no antidote, usually it's supportive care that's given. Uh, usually patients, if they've just swallowed the pills of the calcium channel blocker, they try to evacuate the stomach with charcoal or a bowel irrigation uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and evacuate the stomach and the intestines. Um, 
for severe uh, CCB toxicity, can give they can give IV calcium, um, they can give atropine um, and uh, herbs that or um, medications that mimic your sympathetic nervous system. Um, they can give high dose insulin with glucose and then use different vasopressors. Vasopressors are agents that increase your blood pressure. Um, so from very severe CCB toxicity, we get uh, major decreases of blood pressure. So that would be just something to know about in terms of toxicity or very severe adverse effect of usually overdose from calcium channel blocker. So that's one very important class of cardiovascular medications is calcium channel blockers. Now the next very important class would be what are known as ACE inhibitors, ACEs, and then angiotensin receptor blockers, ARBs. Now I'm not going to review the whole uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system here. I already presented that in a couple videos back, so be sure you understand what that is. But basically ACE inhibitors block the action of ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is the enzyme in the lungs and the lung capillary beds that converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Um, and that's going to result in less angiotensin 2, less aldosterone, and going to decrease blood pressure and decrease fluid volume by having the kidneys diurese more. Uh, these drugs also increase your parasympathetic nervous system and decrease your sympathetic. So a couple of slides, uh, a couple of videos ago, I talked about an alternative hypothesis for heart disease, the kind of sympathetic dominant story. And I said that we really don't have any medications in the pharmacopoeia that um, can increase the parasympathetic system. We have lots that decrease the sympathetics like the beta blockers, uh, the alpha-1 blockers, uh, even the calcium channel blockers block the downstream effects of the sympathetics. But in terms of ACE inhibitors, we have one agent here that maybe increases the parasympathetics. And that's probably why we're seeing in a lot of studies that uh, ACE inhibitors have a very protective effect on long-term outcomes, like in diabetic patients with uh, high blood pressure, with patients with um, kidney disease, renal artery disease, or... Um, uh, chronic kidney disease, like from diabetes or high blood pressure, ACE inhibitors have a very protecting role there as well. Um, but we see them used for hypertension uh, uh, for either during or after an acute MI uh, for different types of heart failure, as well as a diabetic nephropathy, where the diabetes injures the kidneys. Um, and the classic agents would be captopril, lisinopril, enalapril, benzapril, and so forth. I think in terms of the U.S., I've really seen the captopril, the lisinopril, enalapril, uh, I guess the benzapril, um, and then acupril, the, the quinapril, and remapril. So anything that ends in the ill is an ACE inhibitor um, and uh, very commonly used for these different conditions. One very important adverse effect to know about is a persistent cough. We some of the estimates are between 10 up to 40% of people on ACE inhibitors get this persistent dry cough. Uh, and that's due to the fact that the ACE inhibitor blocks uh, or uh, blocks the enzyme that breaks down bradykinin in your lungs. Bradykinin is a pro-inflammatory molecule, so that triggers a cough. Um, very low blood pressure, hypotension, having high potassium hyperkalemia. And that's because the aldosterone levels drop. And when aldosterone drops, uh, sodium levels go down, but potassium levels go up. Um, and having hyperkalemia can induce some uh, dangerous cardiac arrhythmias as well. Um, usually hyperkalemia will slow the heart down. Um, and if that happens in excess, that could be a problem. Headache, dizziness, nausea, renal impairment. Um, this can be evident in the first couple weeks of taking it. Um, so usually we avoid giving any NSAIDs or diuretics, especially in chronic kidney disease. Uh, possibly increased pain from the increased bradykinin in the body. Uh, now, this is a problem I've seen in especially African-American patients. Uh, genetically, there's some reasons for them being at higher risk for developing angioedema from increased bradykinin. That's a very severe, it's almost like anaphylaxis, but not due to histamine, but it can cause respiratory failure and whatnot. Um, so that's a severe adverse effect. I've seen that happen in one patient so far. And um, that actually requires a very specialized treatment with giving um, uh, plasma replacement, uh, where they have to give the uh, special proteins that are found in the plasma to antidote that. Um, we do think in pregnancy, the ACE inhibitors can act as a teratogen, so they're contraindicated. 
and rarely they can suppress the bone marrow, causing neutropenia and agranulocytosis. Um, now, more and more, so this has been, these have been around since uh, maybe the late 60s, 70s, um, and so they have been a mainstay of high blood pressure uh, treatment together with a lot of cardiovascular disease treatment. But there's a newer group of agents now uh, that work in a very similar way, and that is the angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs. They block the effects uh, downstream of angiotensin II at the angiotensin receptors. Uh, and that is going to decrease aldosterone, blood pressure, fluid volume, just like the ACE inhibitors do, but these work further downstream. Uh, they also seem to increase the parasympathetic activity like the ACE inhibitors. Um, the good thing is there's fewer adverse effects. They are newer, so many of them are not off patent yet, and when they're not off patent, they're more expensive. Um, so classic agents would be Losartan, Candesartan, Valsartan, Herbisartan, so these are the Artans, uh, and so forth. Um, so you can look down the list there. Um, their uses are primarily for hypertension, heart failure, uh, especially left systolic heart failure, and we'll talk about that later, and chronic uh, kidney disease and diabetic nephropathy. Um, again, better tolerated, the typical kind of dizziness, headache. They can result in abnormally high potassium hyperkalemia. Um, and infrequently, there can be um, uh, drug reactions like a first dose orthostatic hypotension, rash, diarrhea, dyspepsia, renal impairment, anemia, pharyngitis, nasal congestion, and potential short-term increased MI risk. That's a question mark. I think that came up as a signal in some of the post-surveillance studies, but I don't think that's been confirmed. Uh, so ARBs are kind of taking over as a new kind of step uh, for patients who either can't tolerate ACE inhibitors or uh, a new class of drugs that basically will, it doesn't have all the same adverse effects, but has the same benefits uh, as the ACE inhibitors. So you most likely, if you work with patients with any form of cardiovascular disease like hypertension, uh, they're gonna be on most likely an ACE inhibitor um, or an ARB. Um, one thing I will say before moving on is ACE inhibitors and ARBs should never be prescribed together. Uh, so either one or the other. Now, another very important class of cardiovascular medications would be the diuretics. Uh, these promote diuresis. They're going to decrease fluid volume. Um, so they're going to increase production of urine and increase uh, water excretion from the body. There are several classes. I'm not going to go through all of them um, because not all are used for cardiovascular disease. Uh, and each works at a different place in the kidneys in the nephron. <clears throat> so the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. And very quickly what happens in the nephron is there are these little capillary beds blood comes in to a little capillary bed and uh, basically everything in the blood with with the exception of like red cells and really large proteins and things like that is filtered out into this little space here it's called the bowman's capsule uh, and then the blood leaves and uh, it actually goes through, not shown in this picture, through a series of capillaries that actually is gonna wrap around this system here. And what's gonna happen is as that filtrate, so what was squeezed out is called the ultrafiltrate. As it passes down this little tube, this whole system is called the nephron. As it passes through the nephron, uh, it's gonna go through different portions and without going into all the details, different things will be reabsorbed at different places. So for example, all of the glucose you spilled out here is going to be reabsorbed through special transporters. They're called SGLT2 transporters. Um, your sodium, much of that will be reabsorbed depending on your aldosterone and other hormone levels uh, and so forth. So basically by the time the urine gets to the end here in what's called the collecting duct, and notice that the collecting duct has several inputs. These all come from other nephrons. There are thousands of these collecting ducts and they all actually collect down at the base of the kidneys into what's called the renal pelvis and that's where all the urine basically drips out. So urine is going to drip out of each of these. That's going to collect and go down into the bladder. Um, but basically the uh, nephron is going to dump all this filtrate. It's going to reabsorb 99% of that. Diuretics interfere with some of the various mechanisms at which we reabsorb different things like sodium. Uh, when sodium is reabsorbed in the nephron, water follows it passively. Um, so if we block the reabsorption of sodium, we'll keep water from being reabsorbed and that'll be urinated out. So that's one example of uh, uh, how we can promote diuresis. Uh, 
Many uses for diuretics, the most common would be in hypertension and heart failure. In heart failure, the heart is not pumping the blood around the body adequately, so everything builds up, pools, we get increased fluid volume, and so forth. Uh, they're also used in liver cirrhosis, uh, some kidney diseases, uh, and then um, different things like one diuretic called acetylzolamide uh, can make the urine more alkaline, and that's used to increase the excretion of aspirin and aspirin poisoning. Um, so those are just some of the uses of diuretics. Probably the most commonly used class of diuretics in uh, cardiovascular disease are the thiazide diuretics, and that would include chlorothiazide, which was first introduced in 1958, uh, also known as diuril, but probably most commonly used would be the hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, uh, and it goes by many, many different uh, brand names, uh, and then chlorothalidone, chlorpress, would be the third thiazide diuretic here. Uh, these specifically block the reuptake of sodium uh, in a region of the nephron there called the distal convoluted tubule. So if you go back up to this picture, uh, the distal convoluted tubule is over here. It's at the end of the nephron before it dumps into the collecting duct. Um, so basically by inhibiting the sodium uh, reuptake, it's going to decrease sodium reabsorption and going to increase water excretion. And it also causes the increased reabsorption of calcium. And this is actually important for people who form kidney stones. Uh, many of the kidney stones, the majority of them are formed from excess calcium in the urine. So thiazides can be used actually in treatment there to prevent too much um, calcium from being excreted. It actually tells the kidneys to reabsorb more calcium. Um, but the main uses of thiazides would be hypertension, uh, diabetes insipidus, which is a type of diabetes not related to blood sugar. This has to do with the, uh, the pituitary, posterior pituitary, uh, has to secrete this hormone called antidiuretic hormone. If we can't do that, the uh, kidney then just loses all of its water. It just keeps urinating everything out. Um, but thiazides actually can have a role there. Um, urinary stones, as I mentioned, calcium stones, and then uh, low calcium in the blood can be treated with thiazides by helping the kidneys hold on to more calcium. Uh, the most important adverse effect is low potassium, uh, and that's in up to 70% of patients, and that can induce cardiac arrhythmias, uh, and that is, uh, these are often combined with ACE inhibitors because ACE inhibitors can increase potassium, so by combining the two of them, we can decrease the risk. Um, another important risk factor, another thing you might hear is elderly patients might be told to eat a banana or something every time they take their thiazide, and that's the reason, is that bananas are very high in potassium, and that can help mitigate that. Um, hyperuricemia, that's basically, um, uh, or hyperuremia, um, and that's basically having too much uh, uric acid that is retained in the body. Uh, hyperglycemia. So unfortunately, we find that thiazide diuretics do increase insulin resistance, and that might increase the risk of type 2 diabetes down the road. So some of the uh, guideline committees are actually saying for high blood pressure hypertension, these are very commonly used, that we should actually be using more of the ACE inhibitors ARBs, and I'll go over the recommendations for hypertension later uh, for treatment of those patients. Um, low magnesium is another one to know about. So patients on thiazides, uh, usually we recommend magnesium supplementation on top of their medication. Having too much calcium in the blood, hypercalcemia, and then for some reason the lipids seem to increase a little bit with thiazides as well, and then homocysteine. So paradoxically, we get rid of fluid in the body, but it increases some of the cardiovascular risk factors. So uh, are thiazides really the best choice? And some of the data suggests that we're not seeing the same mortality benefits, uh, decreases, as we see with the other drugs like the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. Uh, so low, low blood pressure, gout, which results from too much uric acid, allergies. This is a sulfa-containing medication. Notice the sulfur group in here. And patients that have allergies to sulfa drugs um, that might be a problem. Now, I'll just say one thing. When a patient says they have a sensitivity to sulfites, that's not the same as a sensitivity to a sulfa medication or to sulfur, dietary sulfur. No one's allergic to sulfur. You'd be dead if you had that. Uh, but sulfites uh, is a thing, and, uh, but that's not the same as being allergic to sulfa medications. Uh, renal failure, lithium therapy, hypokalemia, and um, again, it may worsen diabetes. These would all be potential contraindications. 
So sounds like there's a lot of adverse effects, but these are very commonly used, uh, again, for things like hypertension as a primary therapy. Other diuretics I won't spend as much time on will be the loop diuretics, like furosemide. Um, these are used more in the context of congestive heart failure, for instance. Uh, these block the reabsorption of sodium, chloride, and potassium, and um, they um, are very potent at increasing diuresis, so they're like mega diuretics. Um, they also decrease calcium magnesium reabsorption, uh, so we get more calcium magnesium spilling into the urine. And um, that can also, they also help to increase blood flow to the kidneys by increasing prostaglandins. So we use it for congestive heart failure, uh, different types of severe edema. These are more uh, short-term therapies or used for like end-stage organ disease. Cerebral edema can be given intravenously with mannitol and then uh, pulmonary edema and hypertension I put in quotation marks because it's not a primary or even a secondary agent for hypertension. Um, most effective in patients in impaired renal function um, uh, are actually more effective than the thiazide. So for patients with impaired renal function, these would be better agents. Again, they're not primarily used for the common cardiovascular conditions that we see. Uh, so again, hypotension, hypovolemia, hypokalemia, uh, hyponatremia, hypomagnesemia, you're basically spilling all your electrolytes to the urine, so you get low levels in the blood, dehydration, hyperuricemia, hypocalcemia, ototoxicity. This was a one where especially used with, with what's called an aminoglycoside antibiotic like gentamicin, that can lead to permanent deafness, tinnitus, and vertigo. Uh, so we always, uh, that's always something to be on the lookout for. And then hyperlipidemia again. And uh, long-term use, people become somewhat resistant to it and that's called diuretic resistance. Um, so again, these are not primary agents, but maybe supportive agents in the context of things like heart failure. And the last one will be a class called potassium sparing diuretics. That would be aldosterone antagonist. Uh, and the classic example here would be spironolactone. This is a weak diuretic. Its main effect is that it blocks the actions of aldosterone, which is a mineral corticoid. This is one of your adrenal hormones, steroids. Um, and by blocking aldosterone, it's going to decrease the reuptake of sodium and uh, so forth, and it's going to decrease blood pressure. Um, its other effect is that uh, it is antiandrogen. It blocks androgen receptors. So you might see spironolactone be given to patients with acne and things like this. We're seeing it more in, for example, transgender patients uh, to prevent acne in those patients uh, taking uh, hormone therapies. Um, this could be a drug that's used. Uh, so it's used typically in the context of cardiovascular disease for edema from heart failure, but also liver cirrhosis from kidney uh, failure and nephrotic syndrome, uh, high blood pressure, uh, low potassium, hyperkalemia. Uh, Kahn syndrome is a disorder in which the adrenal gland oversecretes aldosterone, so this would be a potential agent. And then uh, it blocks the androgens like an acne or PCOS as well, I should mention. Um, polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome. We'll talk about PCOS later. There's different types of it, but one type of PCOS, there are elevated androgens. Um, actually, all types of PCOS is elevated androgens, but they're caused by different things. Um, so the adverse effects would be hyperkalemia, hypotension, hyponatremia, and the anti-androgen effects, which in males could lead to breast development and a decreased libido. In females, that can lead to breast pain and enlargement and menstrual disturbances. So that's the uh, summary of the diuretics that we're going to be, uh, we need to know about with heart disease. One other class of medications uh, to know about with cardiovascular pharmacology would be vasodilators. They cause vasodilation. Uh, they're used in hypertension as second or third line agents or for hypertensive emergencies or in some cases of heart failure. Uh, these do unfortunately because they have such a rapid action they can really drop blood pressure quickly they cause what's called reflex stimulation of the heart. And that would increase heart rate, uh, contractility, and increase the heart oxygen consumption. Uh, and this can really exacerbate angina or actually induce an MI or cardiac failure in some patients. Um, this would also increase plasma renin. Um, and so usually um, this is gonna be managed by giving a diuretic uh, and a beta blocker together. So just some uh, indication of how these are used clinically. Uh, the classic vasodilators would be hydralazine. Uh, this is a direct vasodilator of arterial 
and arterial smooth muscle. Uh, used to treat moderately severe, um, to severe uh, hypertension uh, with a diuretic and beta blocker. Uh, it's used as monotherapy in pregnancy-induced hypertension, you know, preeclampsia. Um, the adverse effects would be uh, reflex tachycardia would be the biggest one. Uh, so that's hydralazine. Minoxidil, um, this is a direct uh, vasodilator used to treat, again, more severe to malignant hypertension. We'll talk about what that is uh, that's refractory to other drugs. So these are kind of like end-stage drugs for treating hypertension, severe reflex tachycardia, again, possible here. Sodium uh, nitroprusside, this is used for the treatment of hypertensive emergencies. Um, and um, that is uh, basically one of the mechanisms by which it works is it contributes nitric oxide or NO groups. Um, and uh, remember, nitric oxide is a vasodilator. Uh, this one is administered intravenously. And then finally, uh, in hypertensive emergencies, some of the other medications we already talked about, like the uh, libetalol and the, uh, uh, these are uh, benzodiazepines, like nicardipine, calcium channel blocker. These would uh, all be other medications that are used for hypertensive emergencies. But we'll review that in the hypertensive section. So this is uh, vasodilators. So one variant of that class of uh, vasodilators would be the nitrovasodilators, um, and these are used primarily to treat angina. They're also used in MI. When the patient is having a heart attack, they can be given under the tongue, and they have an immediate action, and they work by dilating the coronary arteries. Um, and they do that by donating a nitric oxide or NO group. Um, so glycerol trinitrate, which is exactly the same as nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is a medicine. Um, and has a very fast onset. It's taken via a sublingual spray or through soft chewable capsules. Uh, it has a pretty short duration of action, about 30 minutes. Um, there are longer acting agents like isosorbide mononitrate and isosorbide dinitrate. And uh, these are used for angina, acute MI, heart failure, uh, as well as, interestingly, esophageal spasms, the isosorbides, uh, for things like achalasia and whatnot can be helpful. Uh, the adverse effects would be a rapid drop in blood pressure, uh, a rebound headache called a nitrate headache that can be very severe after taking it. Uh, the heart again increases heart rate to try to maintain perfusion, reflex tachycardia, and flushing, dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. Um, be contraindicated in anybody with very severe blood pressure, any sort of cardiogenic shock, severe anemia. Uh, now, this is a very important contraindication. Patients taking their night vasodilators for their angina, uh, they might want to, you know, one night take their uh, Viagra, sildenafil. Um, Viagra basically works by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down nitric oxide. And uh, in the penis, this is helpful because it basically keeps more nitric oxide around. It causes vasodilation. Blood fills the penis. That causes erection. But these drugs work systemically, and uh, Viagra actually does, sildenafil actually does drop your blood pressure. So if you take it in conjunction with a vaso nitrovasodilator, that causes profound uh, drops of blood pressure that can be even fatal. Um, there are also numerous drug interactions with these. Uh, fortunately, again, their half-life is very short. They have a short duration of action. And then over time, some patients can develop a tolerance uh, that's called tachyphylaxis uh, that occurs with repeated use, usually within 24 hours if they keep taking it. So if they're having really bad angina episodes, they take a bunch of these. So I've had many, many patients with angina and whatnot that have been taking these, and this is where it's important to know about some of these uh, uh, adverse effects and contraindications. Okay, so that's the nitrovasodilators. We'll talk more about those when we come to angina. Finally, I want to come to the medications that are used to treat cholesterol, so you know something about those. I've already talked about the statins a little bit. Um, the statins are essentially blocking the production of cholesterol in the liver. They're, they're blocking that enzyme, uh, enzyme HMG-CoA reductase. Um, and we do know that lower LDL levels uh, result in a reduction of coronary events and death from cardiovascular disease. Um, now, interestingly, um, about 25% of patients that are on these medications still prevent with coronary events. Up to 50% of patients with myocardial infarctions, MIs, actually have normal cholesterol. 
uh, levels. So again, cholesterol is not the only factor. We got to look at inflammation and so forth. That said, we think the statins actually work uh, not just by lowering cholesterol, but they have other benefits. We find that they actually can stabilize plaque. They can improve endothelial function. Uh, they can uh, reduce the formation of thrombi, and they have anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, so they're used for patients with any sort of coronary heart disease uh, that have increased atherosclerotic risk uh, with or without hyperlipidemia. So even if the cholesterol is normal, some patients are recommended a statin, not for the cholesterol lowering effect, but these other benefits. Um, and uh, I kind of, uh, we'll talk about the guidelines for statin use, but they differ based on primary versus secondary prevention. For primary prevention, uh, for secondary prevention, pretty much anyone that's had an MI or a stroke or whatnot <clears throat> is gonna be recommended a statin. Uh, for primary, pretty much in the age group of 40 to 75, if the ASCBD risk is greater than 7.5%, usually uh, a statin is recommended. Uh, if they have diabetes between 40 and 75, um, then they're going to be recommended a statin. And then um, for primary prevention of anyone with very high LDL, over 190 milligrams a deciliter, uh, that signifies the familial hyperlipidemia. Um, that would be another indication for statin. So these are currently the three primary indications for statin therapy uh, in primary prevention. And here's the list. Uh, so we Statins are either uh, water-soluble or lipid-soluble. So the very first statin was actually mevastatin, and it comes from a mold found in uh, red yeast rice. So the mold is called Manascus purpurea. And uh, this was uh, investigated because in Southeast Asian medicine, red yeast rice is actually given as a blood mover. Um, it's a dietary thing. It's basically, it's a way of making the uh, rice look red, it colors it, but uh, it was found that patients eating a lot of the red yeast rice had very low cholesterol levels, and uh, in Korean herbal medicine, this is actually used as a blood mover. And so they investigated and they found the uh, first statin, and that was called mevastatin. Um, now, in red yeast rice, there are a number of compounds called monocolons, and uh, I think the mevastatin is actually monocolon K. But there's many others. So when you get a red yeast rice supplement over the counter, it contains all the other monocolons. And some argue there's a synergistic effect. So actually red yeast rice is a statin technically, but it has this greater synergism. Now, by definition, if the FDA says if there's any monocolon K in a red yeast rice product, it is a drug. And so technically, uh, red yeast rice manufacturers have to remove all the monocolon K. They can keep the other, mon other monocolons, uh, but monocolon K has to be removed, and um, so it's not a statin drug. Um, interestingly, uh, there was a group that actually took, I think, five or six different red yeast rice products from over the counter at different places and analyzed them and found that some of them actually had pharmacologic levels of monocolon K, meaning they were statin drugs. So this is the problem with the red yeast rice supplements is standardization. Uh, and there are only a few I actually recommend because they do assays on all the things they have in there. Um, so that's monocolon K, mevastatin. Then came lovastatin. Then we have things like Lipitor, atorvastatin, uh, fluvastatin, simvastatin, zocor, and then pravastatin and rosuvastatin are water soluble. Of these, the atorvastatin and the rosuvastatin are probably the most commonly recommended in all the different guidelines. There's also combination therapies where we have cholesterol absorption inhibitors taken with the statin, and that is called, um, so we have the azetamide with simvastatin, it's called Vitorin, uh, so one example of that. Um, so I already went over the actions here a bit, but again, inhibiting HMG reductase. Uh, they seem to also increase the density of LDL receptors on the liver to create more uptake of, of LDL cholesterol and elimination. There's anti-inflammatory and uh, endothelial protective effects as well. So they use primarily to treat hyperlipidemias to decrease the ASCBD risk in patients, both for primary and secondary prevention. And I talked about the different groupings of statins, high intensity versus medium, moderate intensity versus low intensity, and I won't go over that here, but the guidelines suggest different levels for different patients. So adverse effects, let me just go over that because these are very commonly prescribed and it's good to know 
what we need to worry about. Um, so they do seem to increase liver enzymes, although the latest data, so what we used to do is patients we put on statins and we'd have to monitor their liver enzymes uh, every you know, couple of months to be sure that they weren't being elevated. We currently don't need to do that. The evidence shows that that doesn't really do anything. Um, so we don't need to measure their liver enzymes, but some patients it might increase their liver enzymes. Uh, the big thing is with the muscles though. So we see statins increase in a certain percentage of patients up to um, some estimates are 15%, but some say even higher, uh, pain and infl even inflammation in the muscles. Um, and it could be from the fact that the statins block the production of coenzyme Q10, which is a very important mitochondrial nutrient needed for the electron transport chain to make ATP. Uh, and muscle, skeletal muscle, needs a lot of that. So does the heart, by the way. Um, and so low CoQ10 might result in some degree of muscle dysfunction. Um, and so there's you know, some recommendations to actually take CoQ10 with statins, somewhere between 50 and 200 milligrams a day uh, to help with the muscle pain. Uh, there's only a couple of studies that have looked at that. One showed that it was beneficial, the other showed no effect. So the verdict is still out in terms of its usefulness. Um, but the basic muscle effects could be just myalgia, which means muscle aching without any sign of muscle injury or inflammation. I mean, there's probably injury at a microscopic level, but nothing where we're, we're finding elevated biomarkers. And the main biomarker is creatine kinase. This is found inside of skeletal muscle, and that uh, will leak out when muscle begins, uh, shows injury. So myalgia is muscle aching without elevated creatine kinase. Myositis would be actual muscle inflammation with an elevation of creatine kinase, kinase usually over five times its upper normal range. And then very rarely, but very severe and even potentially fatal is rhabdomyolysis. And that's a rapid muscle disintegration in elevation in myoglobin, which can damage the kidneys. Um, and uh, so that's uh, been reported with statins, but again, that's very rare. Uh, but again, in up to 15, I've, I've heard estimates up to 40% of patients with myalgia, uh, patients report myalgia with statins. So if you're, you're treating a patient in acupuncture for muscle pain, back pain, you know, limb pain, that sort of thing, uh, it's important to uh, assess their medication list. You know, are they on a statin? And if, when do they start taking that statin? And how does it relate to the timing of the onset of their pain? So that could be something to look at. Uh, statins also, uh, there's a question about whether or not they increase the risk, like the thiazides we saw, of type 2 diabetes. And uh, that would not be a good thing, uh, but that's currently being investigated. Um, some patients report cognitive defects, so we, cholesterol is actually needed for uh, proper function in the brain, and uh, so could it be that it's affecting cognitive function? And I have seen some reports, the current data and the current recommendations are that statins do not uh, lead to that, but I think uh, time will tell on that one. And then there are various drug interactions like with warfarin, uh, which is an anticoagulant. Uh, not indicated in pregnancy or in nursing mothers and or in children and teenagers. Um, so those are some of the important adverse effects to be familiar with with statin drugs. And I'm sure that list will be modified as, as time goes on, but uh, know a little bit about uh, what we currently know. So another agent that's commonly given or used to be given recommended for patients with high cholesterol is niacin, also known as nicotinic acid or vitamin B3. Um, B3 is of course a necessary vitamin for energy metabolism. It's part of your energy car electron carriers in the body, uh, specifically NAD and NAD NADP found inside of cells. Um, and we need at least 18 milligrams a day to prevent niacin deficiency, which is called pellagra. And that has the three classic Ds associated with it, diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. We don't see pellagra in the United States because of fortified foods. It's uh, all the grain and whatnot is fortified with B3 now. Um, but, um, you know, that's a low-dose niacin, 18 milligrams a day uh, to prevent pellagra. But we have found that at high doses, um, and that's one to three grams per day, uh, niacin can actually lower lipids. And specifically, it can raise HDL, the good cholesterol, lower triglycerides, uh, lower, this should be LDL here, lower LDL a little bit as well. 
It also seems to improve endothelial function and decreases thrombosis. Um, so niacin was often sort of a recommendation for people with very low HDL to get their HDLs up, their good cholesterol. Um, and there's different forms of it. There's crystalline niacin, but that is rapidly absorbed and metabolized, so it has to be taken two, three times a day. And now we have sustained release niacins, which have once a day dosing. Um, so the uses of niacin would be for, again, deficiency, and that would be the RDA levels. But for hyperlipidemia, one to three grams a day. Um, now, what we have found on the studies is it was a little unexpected. So again, we, we have this notion that having high HDL is good for you, decreases your cardiovascular risk, and having um, uh, uh, high uh, low LDL is good too, and that decreases your cardiovascular risk. Well, when they began doing the studies, looking at uh, medications like niacin and whatnot that raise HDL, they actually found that raising HDL did not seem to decrease people's cardiovascular risk. And so the new thinking is that HDL is probably a biomarker uh, for inflammation or something else, that it's really raising HDL is not going to improve cardiovascular outcomes. And so a lot of the kind of committees and whatnot that make guidelines have said, Eh, let's forget about niacin. It really is not uh, showing as much cardiovascular benefit. There still is a role for patients. So if a patient's on a statin already, there seems to be no additional benefit from niacin. Uh, but if they're not on a statin, uh, the niacin could have an effect um, and it could give them some cardiovascular benefits. Um, unfortunately for niacin, one of the common adverse effects is cutaneous flushing. This will be for the high dose niacin and systemic itching, pruritus. Uh, so anything over 20 milligrams, you're gonna be at a higher risk for this. Uh, sometimes aspirin can be given uh, or ibuprofen can be given before taking it uh, to reduce the symptom. Usually when patients take niacin over a period of time, this effect wears off and it's less common with the sustained release versus the crystalline niacin. Uh, but so there is unpleasant effects from taking it. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why, you know, some of the guideline committees are like, yeah, it's too much of a hassle to take this. And we're not, show we're not seeing the real cardiovascular benefits that we were expecting from it. That said, it's still widely prescribed, fairly widely prescribed, especially in the more functional medicine circles and in integrative medicine. So you might want to know a little bit about niacin. Uh, now, some people say, oh, I take my niacin, I get no flushing because I'm taking uh, inositol hexanicotinate, um, IHN. And the data suggest actually this doesn't have the same lipid lowering effect. Um, there's some question mark there. There's potentially some benefit, but um, not from any sort of large scale study. Uh, so it's not giving you flushing, but it might not, not also be protecting you from your heart disease. Um, the uh, adverse effects would be low blood pressure, uh, another adverse effect we're seeing now that we have patients that have been taking it for a while is an increased risk of type 2 diabetes and so insulin resistance. So again, another reason why we're becoming less favorable towards niacin. Heartburn, blurred vision, uh, liver may be inducing hepatitis in some patients, even acute liver failure in rare cases and definitely increases in liver enzymes. Um, even some patients have reported uh, have had uh, hemorrhagic stroke, GI bleeding, again, the diabetes risk, diarrhea, and uh, hyperuricemia. I think this is a good example, again, of this concept of hormesis, where basically if here's this dose response, here is positive effect on physiology, here's negative effect. Uh, you know, no niacin, we got pellagra, but as we increase the dose, you know, to around 18 milligrams a day, we have no pellagra, we have benefit on physiology. Now we increase the high dose niacin, we see more of a suppressive effect. Yes, it's suppressing uh, cholesterol, maybe raising HDL, but uh, it's also potentially having a more negative effect on physiology. So I think of high dose niacin as a drug, not as a natural product, and um, it's uh, gonna have adverse effects. And again, the question is, do, those, uh, do the benefits of niacin outweigh the adverse effects? and uh, or not. And I, I think the evidence is kind of building saying the adverse effects actually outweigh any potential benefits from niacin. Um, so just uh, something to think about niacin therapy. Again, um, if you're in primary care settings, you'll know all about this. 
Uh, but if you're more in adjunctive care, you might see patients taking niacin. You might want to have them have a discussion with their doctor about some of the latest evidence and if that's really useful. Um, one other group of agents to reduce cholesterol would be the fibrates, phenofibrate, gemfibrozole. Uh, and these essentially work primarily by decreasing triglycerides. So patients with very high triglycerides, they also seem to increase HDL and have a little bit of a lowering effect on LDL. And so they're used primarily for the type 3 and type uh, 4 uh, uh, hyperlipidemias, uh, the hypertriglycerolemias. And uh, they do that by activating these very specific uh, receptors called PPARs in cells. And I won't go through that. But basically, that's going to help lower the triglycerides. Uh, typical GI side effects predisposes patients to gallstones. Again, potential myositis and then other drug reactions. Uh, so these are more, you know, add-on agents when the, especially with the high triglyceride patients, not so much for standard cholesterol lowering therapy. Finally, two other uh, uh, drugs or classes of drugs in the cholesterol lowering category would be the bile acid binding resins. So cholestyramine and cholestopol. Uh, and these tend to lower LDL by up to 30%. They raise HDL a little bit, a little effect on triglycerides, and they essentially are going to prevent the absorption uh, of the bile acids, and uh, so any dietary absorption. But also remember, once the liver eliminates all that cholesterol, it goes into the bile, uh, and unfortunately, if we don't have enough fiber in the diet or so forth, we're going to reabsorb a lot of those, that cholesterol. So these agents prevent the reabsorption of that cholesterol. So they're used for the type 2A, type 2B hyperlipidemias, the high LDL hyperlipidemias, usually combined with diet, sometimes niacin. Um, and uh, they're also used for pruritus due to people with jaundice. Um, and that's uh, another application. Remember uh, in jaundice, you might not know this, but in jaundice, as the bile acids collect in the skin, it causes pruritus. Um, so this uh, jaundice is actually build up a bilirubin, which is the pigment in bile. Bile salts are different, but they're constituents of bile. So anytime we have obstruct, obstruction of the bile ducts, we can have an increase of the bile acids in the skin, and that causes pruritus. Well, these bile acid binding resins would prevent that. Um, as you can imagine, this is going to impair your ability to, in, to absorb uh, fat-soluble things, like fat-soluble vitamins and so forth, like vitamin A, D, E, and K. Uh, and so forth. So they're gonna, gonna have to look out for that. So that would be the bile acid binding resins. And then finally, there would be the cholesterol absorption inhibitors. Um, and uh, these, this would be Zetia, azetamide. Um, and uh, that is uh, gonna lower LDL a little bit here by about 17%, lower triglycerides, just slightly raise HDL. Um, and this is gonna prevent any dietary as well as biliary cholesterol that's already been excreted from the liver from being reabsorbed. Um, it doesn't seem to impair the absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins like the bile acid binding resins do. So used for the hyperlipidemias. This is usually an add-on agent for patients who uh, the statin is not doing it. So they're at the high dose statin uh, and the cholesterol is still too high. You might see Zetia or the azetamibe added on as an adjunctive therapy there. Uh, you can imagine you're not going to absorb fat very well, so you get steatorrhea, uh, increased liver enzymes. Again, myop myalgia might be uh, uh, adverse effect, although true myopathy is pretty rare. And then patients with any hypersensitivity to this could get an adverse effect. Okay, so that's a lot of data, a lot of information. Um, we'll look at the specific application uh, in different cardiovascular conditions of these different drugs, but th this gives us a baseline so I don't have to keep referring to each class over and over and over again um, and reviewing them. You can have it all in one place here as a reference to kind of see, you know, what are the basic indications, what's the mechanism of action, what are the most common agents, and then what are the most typical adverse effects. So from this point on, we're going to delve into specific cardiovascular pathology.